Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with PBS SoCal, is pleased to host a conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning author Hector Tobar, author of Our Migrant Souls, a meditation on race and the meanings and myth of Latino. PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress to promote their 2023 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. I'm Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress, and I want to give a thank you to PBS Books for supporting the National Book Festival. Hope you can join us in Washington and online for this year's festival on Saturday, August the 12th. Well, as Dr. Hayden said, the festival occurred on August 12th. It was free and open to everyone. This year, they focused on the theme, Everyone Has a Story. Since then, the Library of Congress has worked to prepare all of the festival conversations to be available to you, representing the voices of nearly 80 outstanding authors. Go to loc.gov slash Bookfest. Well, for more than a month, PBS Books and PBS stations across the country have been hosting a series of 10 virtual events with 11 authors. They are available online on PBS Books and the National Book Festival website. Today's conversation features Hector Tobar to discuss his work and involvement in the festival. His latest book, Our Migrant Souls, A Meditation on Race and the Meaning, and Myths of Latino explores the Latino experience and identity in the 21st century. Latino is the most open-ended and loosely defined of the major race categories in the US. This book assembles Hector Tobar's personal experiences as the son of a Guatemalan immigrant and the stories told to him by his Latinx students to offer a spirited rebuke to racist ideas about Latino people. Let's meet Hector Tobar. Hector Tobar is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and novelist. He is the author of the critically acclaimed bestseller, Deep Down Dark, as well as The Barbarian Nurseries, Translation Nation, and The Tattooed Soldier. Tobar is also a contributing writer for the New York Times opinion pages and an associate professor at the University of California, Irvine. He has written for The New Yorker, The LA Times, and other publications. Tobar's short fiction has appeared in the Best American Short Stories Anthology series, Los Angeles, Noir, Slate, and more. He is a native of Los Angeles, where he currently lives with his family. His newest release, which we're here today to discuss, was featured at the 2023 National Book Festival. It is my extraordinary honor to welcome Hector. Thank you so much for having me. We are so glad to have you. To moderate today's conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite book people in public media, Maria Hall Brown. Maria Hall Brown is the senior director of PBS SoCal, and she joined in June of 1997. She recently won a Telly Award and was nominated for an LA Area Award for the documentary film, American Voices, the personal story of American chorale composers and a broad look at the power of song. She has also been involved in numerous other important documentaries. For 16 years, Maria worked as a producer reporter for the nightly news program, Real Orange, the producer host of the author interview series, Bookmark, and the producer host of the weekly program, LA Art. She has garnered two LA area Emmys and seven Golden Mike Awards for her important work. A proud graduate of the University of California, Irvine. She received a Distinguished Alumni Award in 2005. Maria is a passionate supporter of the arts. Welcome, Maria. So great to be here. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm excited to talk to Hector. Oh, I can't wait to hear your conversation. So without further delay, enjoy. Thank you. Wow, I'm just thrilled to be with you, Hector. I mean, obviously, we just learned an enormous amount about your accolades, your history, your work, and everything like that. But, you know, 
interestingly enough, the most important thing I learned from reading your book is that, you know, some things should not be assumed. It's mm. much better to get the full story because it's always a better story. So we get mm. a chance to get to know you a little bit more right now. And I'm going to start with the whole idea is that you are a massive fan of words. In fact, mm. a dictionary was one of your prized <laughs> first gifts from your father. Yes. You know, my father, uh, when I was uh, fourth grade, fifth grade, wandered over to Pickwick Books in uh, Hollywood, California, and bought me the first expensive present I ever got, which was the first edition of the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. And I realized much later that my father, um, his own mother, my grandmother, was illiterate. I didn't know this until I had written my fourth book many, many years later. And I realized that at that moment, my father bought me a dictionary. He was a person whose mother could not read a word in any language. And he was giving me, his son, all the words in English. So from an early age, I've, thought, I've been taught to treasure language, uh, to treasure public libraries, to treasure books. And I live in a house filled with books. My kids grow up with books. Um, so yes, I'm very much a word person. And along those lines, I think that's why I think that the, the title of this book is so profound and so on point because it's a meditation on race and the meanings and myths of Latinos. And just even that word meditation, that whole idea to ponder, you, I'm sure you've been pondering this for a long time, but what was the, the impetus that had you put it down on paper for the rest of us to understand? Well, I think that Latino people in the popular media tend to be um, the objects of a spectacle. There's the spectacle of the, of the fence and the border and these large groups of people in caravans crossing the border. Um, and, and, and there's you know, also all of these stereotypes um, invective against uh, Latino immigrants. And to me, I wanted to stop and think about ourselves as citizens uh, in the full sense of the word, all the meanings of the word citizen, as people who are active in this country, contribute to this country, and who are shaping this country's future even as we speak. I mean, to me, uh, I think one of the great untold stories of the United States, the United States that we live in today, is that people of Latin American descent are really shaping the way this country feels, the way it eats, and the way it talks, and the way it even thinks about itself as a country. Absolutely spot on. And I think the other thing that I really enjoy about this, and frankly, I've read it twice. And the reason I read oh. it twice is because <laughs> is because you get other people when they, when you read it, you too begin to wonder and to ponder and to want to go further into it. Um, I mean, just even etymology of words, you talk mm. about these words, Latino, Latinx, uh, race, you know, the misnomer of what race is and, and, you know, words that seem to be so scientific and yet they are completely falsehoods. The word Caucasian, you know, that, that end up just being shortcuts uh, to try to explain something that is not necessarily explainable. It's all these words that you have created um, elaborate understanding for. Etymology is imperative in this. And so you, you start going through these pieces to understand things like the word Latino and Latinx is, is very much in the forefront of, is it really something that we've understand the definition of? Yeah, you know, we're, we live in a country where so many people and so many, so many people who tell stories are obsessed with these ideas, these labels, especially yeah. the race labels, white and black, Asian, Latino is supposed to be an ethnic, an ethnic label, but people treat it like a race label. And, and to me, they are just these simplistic definitions, these things that don't really quite fit anybody. And we all feel kind of awkward uh, within them. Uh, Latino is um, an idea that surfaces as this idea of this alliance between people from all these different countries, from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, uh, from South America. We all have in common this heritage of, of being migrants. And so this term Latino was invented to bring us together. Um, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't really explain the complexity of, of us. It doesn't, it doesn't explain that we're all these different colors, um, that many of us have a very, very strong, powerful indigenous heritage. 
others of us are Afro Latinos and we are, you know, we, we, we identify very much with, with black culture. Uh, obviously there's a strong European current within the idea of being Latino because, you know, we have this heritage that goes back to Spain. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's, you know, we, we're all too complicated to really fit inside these labels. And yet, you know, they're supposed to explain who we are, um, explain how we feel. And that to me, I, I see it causing a lot of, of hurt within people, a lot of confusion. So the, you know, the, the cross awareness and the cross understanding and the cross life. I mean, even the immigrant experience, you, you, there's another part that made me really ponder and to think and to understand that trying to say that the Latino experience as an immigrant is, is just singular and down one channel yeah. is a complete misnomer as well, because, Absolutely. you know, the neighborhoods and the people and the influences. And if you look at the geography of it we've got that all wrong as well oh absolutely uh you know i i in the book i described this journey i took across the united states uh nine thousand miles up and down the west coast uh, down to texas uh, south florida all the way up to new york and then across the country again in pennsylvania and all the places where you can find now people who can call themselves latino and the variety of people is just so incredible from people who are of indigenous, who really identify as, as, with an indigenous group in rural Oregon, to people who are Mormon and Mexican in Utah, um, to people who grew up on the border in El Paso and identify themselves as fronterizos, as people of the border, you know, people who've always gone back and forth, uh, to South Florida, of course, uh, you know, and the huge, uh, not just a Cuban population, but a population from all over. Uh, Latin America in in South Florida, uh, and then Atlanta places like Atlanta, which now to me when I go to Atlanta, it feel parts of it feel a lot like Los Angeles. You know, they've been very um, Latinized, um, and they're very incredibly diverse. and And part of their diversity is is this um, sort of Spanish feel of many corners of Georgia and other parts of the South, and finally all the way up to New York. You know, and and just the whole Caribbean, Dominican, Puerto Rican reggaeton feel of New York, which is, you know, of course, reggaeton is all over the country, but I grew up more with the ranchera kind of feel, the trumpets and the big hats of Mexican-American mariachi culture. So, you know, even the music is just so widely varied. And and, and um, yes, and it's, it's great fun to sort of explore that and to think about what are the things that tie all these different kinds of people together. Speaking of Los Angeles, passionate lover of Los Angeles, love its, its, quirkiness, its diversity, its its vibrancy. And you grew up in a really diverse neighborhood that you didn't even think about that there should have been any kind of issue with it whatsoever, but it was it would, it really showcased so many different things. Right. I think, you know, a lot of, uh, I think that is integration of many different kinds of people is something that still happens in lots of corners of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in 1970s Los Angeles uh, alongside people of Mexican heritage, alongside many Filipino people. The neighborhood where I grew up is now called Little Armenia because um, there are so many Armenian people uh, in that neighborhood and also with Asian people, lots of Eastern Europeans. Some of my best friends uh, were from Czechoslovakia, had another friend, uh, you know, white kid from Arkansas whose dad had died in the Vietnam War. You know, we were all this sort of group of basketball players, kids growing up together. And yes, I think that's the, but I think that's the experience of a big chunk of America. You know, in, in one way or another, uh, we encounter all this cultural diversity. And that's true even in lots of rural corners of the United States. You know, you go to small towns in Idaho, Eastern Washington, uh, you even go to places in New England where there is increasing uh, racial and cultural diversity and where you can find, you know, excellent enchiladas. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's something that's become spread to most of the United States. And with all this joy and all this wonder, there's also the issue of what you spoke about really early. And that is um, the unfortunate and needs to be adjusted, changed and altered perception um, of what it means to be Latino and what it means to have um, an immigrant experience and, and how it's portrayed. And one of the pieces, you know, of, of this 
very layer peeling book um, is the victim or the criminal. Absolutely. And, and, and how that doesn't even come close to representing, but how that's just become what's there, what we see. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, if you think about what's the job that most Latino male actors are likely to get, the role they're most likely to get is that of cartel operative, sicario, as they you know call it in Spanish. Uh, and so that's the dominant vision of Latino people in uh, in mainstream American film and television is that of uh, you know the 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 soldier in the drug war or the the kingpin in the drug war. And so, and which of course fits in with a certain rhetoric that, you know, appears in certain uh, circles about uh, Latino immigrants as this danger, people bringing in, you know, drugs into the country. And the other, the other dominant image in the liberal media is of this, sim, you know, simple, uneducated, um, very innocent uh, immigrant who's helpless uh, who is um, confused by the complexity of the United States, you know, someone who has been victimized uh, by cartels and gangs in their country or just victimized by poverty. And it's this portrayal of us as this, you know, largely nameless group of people who just, you know, struggling to live, you know, in the shadows, which is my least favorite uh, cliche about Latino people, that they live in the shadows. And, and that dominates the image of Latino people in the, in the liberal media and many sympathetic accounts, right, of trying to, to um, you know, s reveal, talk about the lives of Latino immigrants. Uh, they, they paint this picture of us as, as powerless and helpless people. And that's just not my experience personally, uh, having interviewed hundreds of Latino immigrants, thousands actually over the course of my career and being the child of immigrants who um, were always just very assertive, educated and confident people. So what did you find on your 9,000 uh, mile journey? I and mean, you've put a lot in the book, but I'm sure that there's a lot that you experienced that you didn't put in the book, mm -hmm. but what did it do for you? And what did you, what happened to you and who did you learn about? And you know, I learned a lot about, and this might seem uh, peculiar as an answer, but I learned a lot about myself. Oh. And I learned that there are little bits of myself all over this country. And allow me to explain. So I, I grew up, you know, with this Guatemalan immigrant parents. My father, really ambitious, only had a sixth grade education in Guatemala, comes to Los Angeles, gets a high school equivalency, and then two years of community college, but always works in the service industry. But a life long lover of books, you know, reads a book a week, my father, usually Roman history, it's his favorite subject. And, you know, and I thought of myself as this oddball, you know, Guatemalan kid, uh, growing up in this family obsessed with books and obsessed with history and ideas. But, you know, traveling across the United States, I find people like that everywhere, <laughs> you know, and all it takes is asking a few questions, um, spending some time in somebody's front yard or in their living room, for them to open up about their dreams, about their ideas. You know, I, I met an artist in Salt Lake City who, who paints uh, these beautiful portraits of Latino people in Utah. I met a construction worker in Atlanta who was a poet at heart and wrote poetry, was very proud of the fact he told me that he had never struck his children, <laughs> you know, because he grew up with so many people who used uh, corporal punishment. And he and he did not because he was he was trying to communicate to me that he was a thoughtful person. You know, I, I wandered into El Barrio in New York and I, you know, I didn't have much time to be interviewing people. I'm driving from place to place. The first person that I started to talk to on, you know, on one of these street corners in El Barrio was this 50 something uh, utility worker who just knew everything about Puerto Rican history in New York, about the radicals of the 60s you know, about the young lords and all the arts movement in, and, and he was just, he was just giving me the lay of the land of where I was standing, you know, where you, he told me where you're standing is sacred ground to the Puerto Rican people because we have fought and struggled here. So everywhere you go in the United States, you can find a Latino person who's thoughtful about his community, who um, loves his community, who loves the United States as this place of opportunity, as a place where they've allowed, been allowed to express themselves, allowed to reach um, the full expression of their intelligence, you know, or have kids who are doing that. 
So, you know, to travel across the United States and, and you know, I, I had this idea of Idaho and Utah and Tennessee as places that were not like where I grew up, but more and more, they are like where I grew up. <laughs> and I think that was the thing that I, that I, that was most impactful to me. It sounds joyous, but along with all of that joy, there's an enormous amount of pain. And you've been Absolutely. able to learn people's painful stories as well. And also the, the pain that was incurred prior to them coming to the United States, the pain that the United States has incurred upon them, um, and just trying to create them a, an awareness and an understanding to make themselves whole again. So there's, there's pain in what we have done to Absolutely. our immigrant brethren? Well, it's also just the pain of separation. Yeah. You know, I think um, uh, a lot of people, I think the verb forced to migrate really kind of covers up a lot about the immigrant experience. Because I think that most people who migrate, choose to migrate, um, they're taking a risk. They tend to be gamblers. You know, they tend to be people who are you know, go, going to uh, embrace this chance that they have, even though it's increasingly risky. And so to a, so for a lot of established Latino families, um, the pain is that you have this border crosser in your past, uh, or maybe he's your parent, he lives with you, and you have the pain of his separation from his family, from his roots. Right. And that's that causes a nostalgia. And of course, it's the subject of, of so many different songs and so much, you know, so much uh, cultural production, right? Um, and that's part of it. Uh, then there's also just the hurt caused by all the stereotypes and all the ugly, you know, um, these ugly ideas about people who are called Latino, these uh, ideas that we're not very smart. I mean, that to me is the most hurtful one. And that's the one that I think we all feel um, the most. We feel this sense that we cannot be intellectual actors, you know, that we're not, uh, we're not ambitious intellectually, you know, um, that colors the way high school counselors talk to their students. It colors um, the way we're portrayed in commercials, the kinds of commercials that we appear in. And so that to me is something that every, every Latino kid growing up in this country feels that. They feel this stigma of the other you know, being seen as the other and the way that people see us. And that to me is, the, is I've spent a whole career trying to overcome that, you know, doing somersaults, publishing books to show people, look, I'm smart. <laughs> you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not this stereotype uh, of who you think we are. And that's, again, another piece of this is the history of how all of that came into being and how mm -hmm. all of that was established. I mean, learning about the frontier thesis I actually started thinking about you know, public education and what did that mean? And public education was designed literally to make Americans out of immigrants to make sure that their civil uh, behavior was in a certain way and their language is a certain way. I mean, you got me pondering in all these different directions, but the history of how long this happened is incredibly eye-opening, the limitations on immigration and, and, and the changes in the laws and the verbiage and everything. Um, a remarkable amount of research, something that mm. you had known and found a spot for or something that you pursued in trying to tie all of these threads of these stories together? Well, you know, I've been a history buff ever since I was seven years old um, because my father was going to community college when I was seven years old. He was going to get his AA degree and he brought home, uh, and I still have it, uh, he brought home this really thick American history textbook 1970s American history college textbook and it had all of American history in there and it was like oh my god it was just I just I just loved reading uh, about the American Revolution and the Civil War and the battles of the Civil War and all the amendments and um and yes yeah, so I that's a whole this book reflects a whole lifetime of being essentially a history geek um, but we're not generally speaking Latino people aren't inside that history and so my work 25 years as a journalist, 25 years of writing about Latino communities, I have learned a lot about the way in which our story uh, is braided in with this American history that I learned about uh, in school and in college. You know, Latino history uh, is part now of this country's history, and but we're not we're not really told it, and we're also not told much about the history 
that we bring with us from other countries. You know, I think the average American kid knows very little about the Mexican Revolution, almost nothing about the Salvadoran Revolution and Civil War, which is one of the great events of the 20th century. This, you know, improvised army of peasants facing off this army, um, you know, equipped by the United States. You know, all of these events of Latin American history are unknown to us. And yet there are literally, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of kids who bring this history with them into American neighborhoods. They bring the memories of the Salvadoran revolution. The legacy of the Mexican revolution is alive so much in Southern California and other places, right? Um, and, and the other part of it is that, you know, the, the United, United States history is really interesting as the way it forms ideas about race, right? The idea of white and black is created in American history to explain slavery. You know, we now know that race is um, an absolutely non-scientific idea. There's no basis in science. Um, and yet we think of it as this scientific uh, category that to which we belong. But in fact, it's just a myth. It was created to explain slavery. Asian is a category created to uh, explain where Chinese and Japanese migrants uh, fit in the social fabric of the United States. And Latino is this idea that uh, exists to explain where all these migrants fit in the race scheme, you know, in the structure of the United States, how we're part of this American story. Um, so to me, untangling that and finding out that, you know, we're part of this, as you say, this longer history of migration and xenophobia and pushing people away, working them in, taking their labor, but also trying to limit how many of them there are that same thing happened to the Italians, the same thing happened to the Jews, the same thing happened to the Chinese, and so forth and so on. So much to talk about. Um, <laughs> just wanted, I wanted to let everyone know, I'm Maria Hall Brown from PBS SoCal, and you are watching PBS Books in celebration of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm here with Pulitzer Prize winning author Hector Tobar. We're discussing his latest book, Our Migrant Souls, a meditation on race and the meaning and myths of Latino. All right, Hector, one of the things that uh, you made me think of when you were expressing all of these histories that are not uh, part of the vernacular that need to be, they're, they're rolling out, but they're being rolled out in very um, limited mm -hmm. channels and separately. And you mm -hmm. have uh, something in your book which just illuminated it so viscerally. It's like having an individual orchestral performer go out mm. and play his instrument alone and have each right. one of those uh, performers come out and play. And yet you're missing the beauty of the entire production. Um, right. Is it slightly changing? Are we, are we moving in any good direction to mold these stories together and to make these stories um, part of everyone's story? Yes, I, I think that Increasingly, if you look at the work of American historians, there is a lot of work being done on how different groups have interacted with each other in American cities throughout American history. You know, I remember the first time uh, that I became aware of just how long the United States has been really racially diverse and how long people have, you know, worked alongside each other and lived alongside each other when I read this wonderful history of New York City called Gotham which describes how poor white indentured servants and blacks lived alongside one another in Manhattan, in New York, uh, you know, in the, as far back as the 17th century, you know, and there were these fears of poor whites and, and blacks working together to start a revolution or an uprising in New York City, you know, back in the 17th century. Uh, and now today we have scholars like the wonderful George Sanchez, who's written a history of one Los Angeles neighborhood called Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles, a neighborhood originally settled uh, in large numbers by Jewish uh, migrants from the Eastern United States and from other, part, from other parts of the world who came to, uh, to Boyle Heights to create a Jewish community, but at the same time, alongside people of Italian descent, uh, Mexican descent, many, many Japanese and African-American uh, members of that community also. And so, yes, as like I say, it's like, you know, we have in most American cities, you have people of many different backgrounds living alongside one another. And so why do we tell their history separately? Why do we have, you know, just tell African, you know, it's, it's important to, to do that, 
it's important to understand African American history has these traditions, but there's also this history of cooperation and interaction um, that takes place, and, and definitely Latinos are, are very much a part of that. Going back in history, um, you know, there is this myth, or mm. however you a story, of priding ourselves of, of welcoming um, all kinds of diverse populations from around the world for a number of reasons. Um, and yet it seems as time has progressed, we've become numb mm -hmm. to the atrocities of other places, the heartache of others, and um, even what has happened in our own country. You, you bring up some things about um, memorializing um, mm. where tragedies have taken place. Um, the Walmart that you went to in which there's, uh, you know, in Texas where, you know, so many people lost their lives and yet, life goes on. Um, mm. Is our numbing of mm. humanity altering our interest or our energy or our veracity in, in mm. making change? Well, I think this process of feeling numb actually serves a very um, negative social function. Mm -hmm. So by being numb about, oh, there's like so much violence and so many people dying at the border. And, you know, it, it's a way in a way of, of accepting it, you know, of saying that, uh, of accepting no the normality of it uh, and, and not and not embracing this idea that we should fight against the inequality, uh, the, the attitudes that produce that kind of violence, right? Um, so, you know, we have, we, and it also what it does is it, it, it creates this lie that we're not interdependent on one another. Mm -hmm. So thousands of people attempt to cross the Sonoran Desert. Hundreds die every, every summer, if not thousands. The true number is, is not known as uh, the work of Jason DeLeon, this one anthropologist who I quote in the book. Uh, his work has shown that we we, we probably are, are severely undercount undercounting how many people are die crossing the border every year. But those the, those people trying to reach the United States, they're trying to do work here. They're they're doing work um, that Latino people do because this country is dependent on their labor, their low paid labor. So the wealth and comfort that we feel as Americans in this country depends on the labor of people who have this violence hovering over them, the violence of the border, right? Of having to cross um, not just the barriers of the border, but also facing all of these criminal gangs that now have monetized uh, the crossing of the border, right? Taking advantage of these barriers to, to um, you know, take money from people uh, and, and to torture them and, and, and uh, you know, as they're crossing. Um, so our comfort, you know, the order of your average American suburb, you go to a suburb of Los Angeles, like San Dimas, right, or Claremont, these really places where you find these beautifully manicured lawns. Well, Latino labor is doing that. And very often it's the labor of people who have undocumented members in their family, right, uh, people who are accepting lower wages um, because that's, you know, because they have this immigration status hovering over them. So our comfort, our, the ease of our lives is dependent on the labor of people who have to risk their lives or face death, even trying to go back and reach their families in, in Latin America. So absolutely, I think that the numbness is, is something that serves uh, as a way to forget and try to erase that relationship that we have with one another. And yet there is hope on the horizon to a certain degree, I hope, because um, you recently spoke to the graduating class of the University mm. of California, Irvine Humanities, and you call them superheroes <laughs> because they have superpowers. And you work as a teacher, you hear wow. stories, you understand. So are there enough superheroes with superpowers in our future to switch this narrative around and to reignite our nerve endings so that we're not numb and to rewrite these stories so that they're not singular and to stand up and fight again for the 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 humanity of us all yes well um Yes, I did deliver this speech and I, I called the, the graduating class of 2023 there at uh, UC Irvine. I call them 
uh, superheroes. I told them their superpower mm -hmm. is one that I learned when I was in college, which is called critical thinking. <laughs> because, because critical thinking gives you like an x-ray vision. You know, you see things apparently in one way and you adopt this tool of critical thinking and you study history, you study social relations and you understand truths that are not obvious to everyone. So you as an educated person get to see them and it's your job to teach others, uh, you know, what's really happening. So to me, uh, this country with its excellent, still excellent public education system, especially in a state like California that has a wonderful community and still affordable community college system that allows, gives people second chances. You know, you can, you can be a, a terrible high school student, uh, you know, go work uh, in fast food for a couple of years and then transition into community college and, and start a career in your, in your late twenties or early thirties. So this country has an incredible public education system, an incredible public library system. You know, most countries, in many countries of the world, there is no such thing as a public library <laughs> where you can go and check out books like I did when I was growing up in Hollywood. So all of that creates, um, it helps to create uh, warriors and thinkers, um, future leaders, uh, future prophets and, uh, you know, uh, priests and, uh, <laughs> and all kinds of different people who are going to uh, change this country and give us um, a new vision of where it might go. Absolutely. So you didn't start out as a writer or you did not start out to intend to be a writer as much as you love words and books and everything. You were going to be a doctor. That's right. <laughs> you know, you know a lot about me. That's kind of, yeah, I was a, a pre-med student when I went off to college. I was 17 when I went to college and I had this idea that I wanted to do good. And my father said that there were two possible professions that I could follow. One was either being a lawyer or being a doctor. And he preferred that I try to be a doctor because he didn't like lawyers very much. Sorry <laughs> to, to the member of the legal profession out there, many of whom are my friends. Uh, you know, I so I went as a pre-med student. And, and I also, I had no, even though my, I grew up in a family with books and, uh, you know, a father who read voraciously, I did not know that I could become a writer. It was like, I didn't know that was a profession. It wasn't anything that I'd ever been exposed to. I remember the first time that I saw a, a, a writer read in public. It was at a bookstore in San Francisco. And by then I was like 22 or 23 years old. Uh, I, it was the Chilean writer, Ariel Dorfman, who had come to San Francisco to speak about his books. I had never seen a writer before in person like that. And, in the, you know, I started working at a community newspaper and then I became a, a professional writer making $9 an hour um, and getting to tell stories and also trying to make up for the fact that there weren't many stories about Latino people or Latino journalists working uh, in the profession back then when I started in the in the late 1980s. There were some, uh, but there weren't nearly uh, enough to cover these burgeoning communities. And so I, I started by telling stories about Latino immigrants, but also just doing investigative reporting about homelessness and the mentally ill and all sorts of other subjects. And so, yeah, I became a, a writer by accident, really. Um, I, I wandered into a Mexican bread store, saw a stack of free newspapers. One of the newspapers said we need volunteers, and that became my, that became my job. Um, so, well, yeah. But now my next thought is that you did not become a doctor, but you have changed lives. I mean, you've been part of this <laughs> Library of Congress Festival of Books. You have uh, obviously working for the LA Times, got the Pulitzer in being part of the team for the 1992 LA riots. Your books have been, your book has been made into a feature film. Um, you now have this book that I believe should be required reading for all students um, and you are teaching. So do you ever step back and think, I didn't become a doctor, but I am making people's lives better. I really love being a storyteller, whether that be in a book, uh, in a book that will go on the shelf of a public library or a bookstore, or hopefully in somebody's home, like my own bookshelf, which is filled with the books of other people, um, or um, you know, being a storyteller to a lecture hall. Uh, you know, I teach, um, I teach classes in literary journalism and English and Chicano Latino uh, culture uh, at UC Irvine. 
and a lot of it is just putting on a performance and telling a story about uh, about Chicano Latino theater or um, you know a, a Chicano Latino novel, and and just you know and just passing on what I've learned during a lifetime of of reading, a lifetime spent in libraries and uh, on my couch. Uh, devouring books and being lucky enough uh, to write them and hoping to pass on hope pass on whatever knowledge I have knowledge of the craft of writing to new generations of writers uh, that's a lot of what I do also um, because it's a really wonderful craft is very powerful one to be able to put your I ideas into words I grew up watching so much great public television that shaped my reading habits also um, everything from, you know, I, Claudius uh, to Nova and so many great, great programs over the years that really enriched my life. So just trying to give a little bit back. That's all. Well, um, I know you've said that people read for information and uh, people read uh, for curiosity, but I'm going to quote something to you that is another writer, William Nicholson, when giving life to C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. uh, in the film Shadowlands said, we read to know we are not alone. And I think that that is what you have very clearly done. Oh, thank you so much. I, that's, you know, my, my ideal reader is someone who's really curious about Latino people, maybe wants to figure out more about his Latino or her Latino neighbors, but also that Latino kid who thinks, you know, wow, how, how do we, how does our story fit in? You know, I have all kinds of crazy people in there. I have assassins in my book. The Donner Party is there, the famous Donner Party, uh, and the poor Mexican teamster who got, uh, you know, got um, uh, lost his life in the in the uh, Donner Party crossing the Sierras. There's all kinds of character. Frida Kahlo uh, is is in the book too. Um, so it's it's a. I tried to make it something that that, that people would want to turn the page and keep on reading. So, uh, thank you so much for all the kind words you've said about it. Yeah. Read twice, maybe three times. So I really want to thank you. And I think we also need to thank Dr. Seuss because I know he was a big influence on you. Um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, that was my, the first book I can remember my parents buying for me was Dr. Seuss A to Z. And I remember the moment in which my, uh, my kindergarten teacher at Grant Elementary School in East Hollywood, California, told my mother, Mrs. Webb, my elementary school kindergarten teacher, told my mother, you know, you should, you need to buy this, buy, buy this kid a book. He, he's already pretty smart. Buy him a book. And here's a, here's a book you could buy him. And, and, you know, my parents ended up buying that book for me. And uh, yeah, it was the beginning of a lifelong love of reading. Well, thank you that inspired this wonderful writer. So I want to thank you very, very much for spending this uh, wonderful time with me and all of the viewers that have enjoyed the opportunity to get to know you better. And um, I'm just privileged to have had this moment in time. And I hope that I have the opportunity to meet you in person soon. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful interview and for being such a careful and thoughtful reader of my book. I'm honored and privileged. And I do want to invite back at this time, uh, Heather Marie Monteo, who is going to kind of put a bow on all of this wonderful, wonderfulness that we've had. Well, thank you, Maria. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And Hector, thank you so much for your insights, for your important work, and for your superpowers, both writing and critical thinking, um, and for helping us to learn more about the meaning and myths of Latino. In many ways, this conversation epitomizes the 2023 National Book Festival's theme, Everyone Has a Story. So thank you both for having this happen. We appreciate it. This year, as we celebrate the Library of Congress National Book Festival, I also wanted to share that for the first time in history, the Library of Congress's Poet Laureate and the Youth Ambassador for Literature are both Latinas, Ada Limon and Meg Medina, respectively. So as we think about the story that we will continue to be told, I believe also that a new story is being written. Well, as you all know, I'd like to thank our library partners, more than 1,800 strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations, especially PBS SoCal, for joining us and sharing this important content with all of you. Most importantly, we'd like to thank you for being here. Just a reminder that the Library of Congress National Book Festival content is now available. You can go to loc.gov slash bookfest. 
And another reminder that PBS books and conversations are now available. There will be one more tomorrow evening, but they're now available at PBS books and the Library Book Festival website. Well, we've really enjoyed being able to share this conversation with all of you. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla and happy reading.